brilliant. And I've just started to record as well. So um, today's uh, session is uh, Make Sure It Adds Up, and it's about uh, Bradford District's campaign, uh, which really focuses on getting um, residents and our workforce to really critically analyse information that they see, read or hear before they kind of forward, share with others, and also be really confident in challenging um, what they are reading, uh, what they're hearing, and also just to be curious and ask questions. Um, I'm going to share just a very short video first. So I'll just um, stop sharing that for a second. I'm going to share another screen of mine just to get... Uh, this is the video. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear it okay. I is is it supposed to be I can't hear anything. <clears throat> you say you can't hear anything? Yeah, I ca I can't hear. Is that the There's same no sound. Else? There's no sound. Is that the same for everybody else? Yeah, I can't uh, hear either, Zara. Yeah, there's no sound. OK, well, that's hmm, OK. I'll come back to that. Uh, what I'll do is I'll pop it into the chat because I'm not sure why that isn't playing. But it is only a minute and a bit sort of uh, in terms of the video length. So I'll let I'll pop that in the chat and you can watch that in your own time. But it's just a very short video that kind of explains about um, what the Make Sure Ads Up campaign is about. Um, I'll just stop um, sharing that because I'm, I'm not sure what what the issue, technical issue might be around that. Um, let me go back to my slides um, and I will go to the next part. Uh, so look. Right, OK, just to give you a little bit of background, basically, to uh, make sure it adds up. The campaign itself is actually focused on four sort of key areas and the LGBTQ plus is one of them, but it also focuses on uh, Muslims, um, migrants and our white working class communities and the reason why these were particularly selected is based on the amount of misconceptions, myths and disinformation, fear-mongering that you get sometimes, the demonization of these particular communities, victimization, marginalization, discrimination and increased levels of hate crime for these particular communities and in some respects it's been actually very damaging uh, for a large volume of people across um, just the country as well. I think worldwide that probably would be quite true. So today's session is going to be using parts of the Make Sure It Adds Up toolkit and we are going to be focusing on the LGBTQ plus because given that it's the history month. Um, just to say as well the toolkit itself can actually be adapted quite rapidly for other things such as Covid and we have used it for that. Um, so I'm going to just gauge uh, just before um, how people are feeling about the sessions. Uh, so how people are feeling today generally. So if you want to give me basically a one for excited or feeling good and a zero for maybe OK or a meh, not all right, just to gauge what people are feeling so far. Oh, excited. OK, that's good. Oh, generally, quite a lot of people are in a good mood. That's always great because it means we'll, we'll hopefully start the session in a really great way. All right, brilliant. That's really useful to know. Um, OK, so um, just to give you, uh, again, a little bit more background to make sure it adds up because um, it's we didn't come up with it in terms of Bradford. It's actually come from the Intercultural Cities programme, which Bradford, uh, Bradford Council um, and, the, and the district is member of. Um, the Intercultural Cities programme in itself um, really reviews and adapts policies through an intercultural lens um, and they develop um, intercultural strategies to manage diversity as an advantage for the whole society. So the Intercultural Cities actually is also a platform for uh, cities across worldwide. So I think they've got 140 now that are members of the Intercultural Cities programme. And it's a way for other cities to kind of connect and learn from each other, share good practice um, and basically share different initiatives that are going on. Um, we basically adapted this particular campaign, the Make Sure Ads Up, from um, Barcelona. And they were running it at the time as something called Anti-Rumours. Um, and 
essentially what it takes is, is a number of different sort of steps. Um, what it's looking at is identifying uh, the sort of major rumours that exist within the city or a place. And that's one of the reasons why Bradford is concentrating on those particular four focus areas. Um, but also they look to um, create sort of counter narratives and they look at creating a network of anti rumour champions or what they call as agents. And it's about designing and implementing sort of campaigns to raise awareness. And we've done that through the Make Sure Ads Up with lots of different types of uh, resources. So, um, and you can come off mic on this one, but does everybody know who this guy is? Yeah. Go on, who is it? <laughs> Donald Trump. Yeah, and I think I think everybody kind of knew who, who this was because he actually said some of the most outrageous things, isn't he, in his career. So here are some statements that I've got. There's four statements on the screen and I want to, I want you to give a little bit of time just to read what these four statements are. And I would like you just to think about which one of these four statements you think is false. Now, um, whichever one you think is false, if you just want to put it in the chat, whether it's one or two or three or four. So I'm going to give you a couple of, just a couple of minutes just to do that. Sorry, is it worth reading the statements out just yeah, in case um, yeah, anyone is going to struggle to read off the coloured backgrounds? Absolutely, yeah, really good point. So number one says, if I were to run, I'd run as a Republican. They're the dumbest group of voters in the country. They believe anything on Fox News. I could lie and they still eat it up. So that's number one. Number two says, it's freezing and snowing in New York. We need global warming. Number three says the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. And number four says, sorry, just let me just move that. Number four says, well, if I ever ran for office, I'd do better as a dem Democrat than a Republican. And that's not because I'd be more liberal. It's because I'm conservative. But the working guy would elect me. He likes me. When I walk down the street, those cabbies start yelling out of the windows. So what you're, all you're putting in the chat is which one do you think is false? Oh, false. What you think is false? Mm. Yeah, go with that one. Okay, we've got a few ones. Just give, we've got 10 people on the call. We'll just give people a fair bit of chance to, we've got a bit of mixture now, maybe four, maybe two, okay, four. Oh, well, that's interesting. Has everybody had a chance to have a go at doing that? It's probably a, a couple of more people. Okay, a couple more fours. Okay, so um, I will reveal the answer, right? So that's actually number one that's false. So it was the <laughs> well done. But um, I guess um, the purpose of this particular exercise, very quickly, is just to, just to say it's very hard to actually tell what is real and fake particularly what's on the internet, because um, uh, I think we all know what Trump is like. We know the kind of things that we would say. So I think generally people shared number one. Actually, this was something that was put out on um, Twitter and it was shared by hundreds and thousands of people because they felt it was the kind of thing that Trump would say. Um, but um, and, and what you'll find is that a lot of extremist groups, um, lots of people with a particular kind of agenda will actually go out and really spread lots of lies. Um, and this is one of the ways that they will do it, because um, they will try to run false statements that are very close to actually what they, what people might think is real. OK, so um, obviously everybody thinks it's in our niche to do so, um, but they are obviously external influences. I 
for example, our upbringing, up, upbringing, our culture, our experiences, our education, that will basically will, in, will really shape our way of thinking and what we're thinking about. And I think the thing to really think about is that our thinking for that reason can be biased, it can be distorted, it can be partial, it can be uninformed or sometimes downright prejudiced. Um, and when you think about, I mean, this statement as well, I think people probably heard about that the quality of your life is determined um, and produced by the quality of your thought. Um, and that's because actually we have about 60,000 thoughts a day and 70% of our thoughts, believe it or not, are actually the same thoughts that we have every day. So a lot of what we think tends to be what's on autopilot and it tends to be things that are habitual, uh, things that we do um, on a day to day basis. So a lot of the, lot of the times our subconscious brain actually just takes over. We don't do sort of awareness thinking, if that makes sense. A lot of our 70 percent of what we're thinking is actually subconscious. Um, and, and actually, a lot of our thoughts also affects our emotions. So whatever you're thinking about will drive how you're feeling at the time and then in turn will uh, influence how we behave. So thoughts are really important part um, of um, uh, being aware of that is really important part of us understanding um, what influences our behaviour. And the solution, I guess, is really to think about how we can develop more critical thinking, so more awareness about what we're thinking. Critical thinking um, can be described as the ability to think clearly and rationally, understanding the logical connection between ideas. And it can also be described as the ability to reflect and think independently when considering whether you believe something or not. So it's about really thinking about all the information that's presented to you at the time and to review that information and really consider what you're hearing. So when we think critically, we're able to safely and respectfully question ideas and assumptions rather than just simply accepting them. So we are what we're doing is really exploring different viewpoints. So we're finding out different ideas. We're looking at different arguments. We're even thinking about um, the news. We're thinking about what rumours are, uh, you know, being presented here to get a full idea of what the picture is. So critical thinking basically allows us to identify and explore problems and um, in, in a way that's balanced and measured and constructive. And just to say as well, during um, COVID, I think disinformation was absolutely massive. Um, and I think more and more we realised that particularly within schools um, and young people and adults, critical thinking was more and more needed. In fact, um, the Ministry for Digital and, and Culture set out a strategy around disinformation. Um, and this was about um, making sure that every child in school was getting some of that critical thinking knowledge. Um, surprisingly, 40 percent of adult Internet users don't have the skills to critically uh, assess information online. And children up to the age of 15 are particularly vulnerable with studies from the Natural Literacy Trust find that just 2% of our children have critical thinking skills needed to tell fact from fiction online. So it's absolutely a huge, massive problem. But when you're thinking about um, critical thinking, it doesn't absolutely happen in stages. It's not linear. Um, so just think about on the on the right hand side, you've got sort of identifying assumptions, um, checking um, accuracy and validity, taking al alternative perspectives and taking informed actions. Um, and so just recognising that when you're presented with information, you could be actually anywhere on this kind of wheel. Uh, but to be aware of it and actively um, you know, check what you're hearing. Um, just to say as well that a lot of stereotypes from what you're hearing often leads to discrimination and misinformation, and they do actually contribute to a very dysfunctional society and system. And when we, what we mean by that is um, what we describe as um, whether the relationships or behaviours which are different to what we think is normal um, actually can itself be quite damaging because automatically we exclude people that do not fit into what is perhaps white or male or heterosexual, etc. because they are different. So what are some of the things that can happen when we don't think critically? Anybody got any ideas? You're welcome to come off me or put on chat. As you said, if we don't think critically, the um, 
the, the thoughts, the subconscious thoughts, maybe of how we've been brought up, what we've been educated, the places where we live, the experiences that we have, can form preconceived assumptions that lead to predigy, pred, I can't say that word, sorry, and discrimination, discriminatory behaviour then that offends other people and really ultimately yourself because it's coming from a, a place of ignorance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, um, I'll just move on to the next slide because I think you've kind of covered quite a fair bit there. Um, so when we think, um, I guess, don't we don't think critically, there's lots of different things that can actually happen and they end up to being quite negative. So, of course, you know, we can jump to conclusions about people and we make particular um, assumptions um, about people's backgrounds, their lifestyle, perhaps their beliefs or what they think about particular things. Um, can actually lead to very negative thinking about particular, you know, we could we can demonise a whole group uh, of people just by what we might think um, about a particular uh, concept or an idea. Um, we can uh, lose track of perception. Um, we can accept false inaccuracies. Um, sometimes then we're not they're not being fact checked. Um, perhaps they are rumours, they're stereotypes. Perhaps they come from a place of ignorance, but we accept them as absolutely truth. Um, they are one sided. So we're not really hearing about people's lived experiences. We're not thinking about different um, perspectives on a particular issue. I mean, I interestingly watched a video quite a long time ago and it was a video asking a group of people about lots of different um, statements. And um, it was interesting because uh, I think people assumed that when you were watching the video that everybody would have one homogenous view because this was a group of Muslims that had uh, that were uh, they were on this video and actually they just um, on every one of those topics they were completely dis dispersed on every issue and that just goes to show that there isn't actually one-sided thinking we all don't think the same our experiences our influences um, our, maybe the friendships that we have our family backgrounds our culture you know, will have a, a large part to play about the way that we think about things. Um, the other thing, obviously, that's quite dangerous this, is that we ignore our own ignorance about things. Um, so we we just assume that whatever we're thinking might be completely right. Um, and it's not the fact that perhaps we don't know enough about a particular subject or topic area. Um, I guess the, the thing as well to think about is critical thinking is about how you're thinking about things, not about what you're thinking. And so there's a slight distinction and difference. There isn't um, a correct way to think, um, really. We, we all think in the way that we think. So there's no correct way to think. But um, I think it's more important that we don't take the moral high ground. And um, I think we we are all guilty that, uh, you know, we sometimes take things at face value and we could do a lot more to learn um, about things and, and, and do more about increasing our knowledge about a particular uh, topic. So um, the campaign itself uses um, a counter narrative. And I just wanted to just touch on this because um, myth busting, uh, especially during COVID, was quite, um, I suppose, uh, everybody talked about myth busting as the most important thing. Um, and you see lots of examples during COVID where people were talking about particular myths, you know, or things that were coming out as false information and people were combating them with what they thought was the truth. Um, and what we're literally just finding out, uh, I guess, when it comes to people's stories, uh, lived experiences, actually myth busting um, on a lot of occasion demonstrates doesn't actually work because it's not enough just to say, um, it's almost like saying you're right and um, uh, or I'm wrong or I'm right and you're wrong. And it's also saying that sometimes there are things that are completely uh, fact or uh, fiction. Um, so myth busting, you know what involves really is, is actually discrediting someone's beliefs or thoughts by saying they're wrong or um, it's untrue and uh, generally we know what happens when you tell somebody that they are wrong people generally tend to get the right defensive they'll stop listening and they'll want to defend their ideas um, myth busting also i think gives platform to lots of um, negative narrative um, so uh, i think as soon as you start myth busting or try to create some narrative out there that's around that people generally tend to use that as an as a, an opportunity to really vent a lot of their um, issues or um, perhaps if they share sort of similar beliefs. Um, 
So myth busting um, isn't something that we generally tend to use. What we do instead is try to tell a counter narrative and we tell it with a new story instead of arguing against a false one. So I just want to give an example of this. Does anybody know what this creature is? Looks like a guinea pig, hamster, doesn't it? I was going to say, it's not a fat hamster, which is what I thought it was. <laughs> I was just going to say, and Finn and Tahir can't say it because they know what this is. <laughs> so it's not a fat hamster. Does anybody not a know? guinea pig. Is it a guinea pig? It's not a guinea pig. Not a guinea pig. No. Nope. <laughs> Any other? Okay, I'll tell you what it is. It's a it's a lemming. Oh, okay. It's a lemming. Okay. Um, and the reason why does anybody know about lemmings? Does anybody Rose, know any facts about vaguely, them? Vaguely, vaguely know what you're going to say. Yeah. Go on. Well. No, I said it's, it's a vague recollection of, of them, but... OK, but you're not. OK, that's fine. Yeah. Does, does anybody know any, any sort of facts about lemmings or... Any don't they all jump off I together? Don't they, they all jump off something together? I'm not quite sure. I can't remember it exactly. So, so brilliant. Thank you, Jay, for mentioning that. <clears throat> so um, the thing about lemmings is uh, they are some... What we always find that with some myths, there are always going to be some levels of truth. However, you know, there are particular myths, um, especially around lemmings, that are actually based on some behaviour. So lemmings um, have large populations and they do boom, boom like every three or four years. But when the concentration lemmings become really high, what happens is um, a large group of lemmings will go, up, go off and search for a new home. Um, now, um, it's interesting that you said that, Jane, about them jumping off cliffs, because <laughs> I've, got a I've got a little bit of story about this. So that so where you probably might have got that from, um, if you don't if you don't recollect re it, but um, Disney did uh, a couple of documentaries probably in the 1950s, and um, there was a particular one that was called Wild Wilderness, and what they were really featuring here was basically a documentary about wildlife, and they also featured uh, lemmings, um, and one of the things uh, that they showed in on this particular documentary was lemmings actually. Uh, drowning after jumping off cliffs and into the sea. Um, but one of the things that um, Disney didn't really make clear was that this was actually fake, because lemmings don't do that. Um, and it was actually staged by filmmakers to replicate supposed real life behaviour. Um, and so this was actually massively exaggerated. So that's just one example of sometimes when we hear things, something stick in our brain, we don't know where we've heard it from, and actually sometimes they aren't even true. And this is, you know, um, you know, credible, what we think are credible companies. Um, I'm going to pass off to Taya now to do this next bit. Taya, over to you. Thank you. OK, so thank you for that, Zara. Um, so this next section is all about stereotypes um, and we're going to be looking at typical statements that some of you guys might have heard about the LGBTQ plus community. Now, when it comes to stereotypes, stereotypes are everywhere. Now, they manipulate the truth and generate a false narrative, leading to a lack of understanding and erroneous assumptions. Many stereotypes can be misconstrued and inaccurate. And in the LGBTQ plus community alone, stereotypes have resulted in misconceptions, wrongly held beliefs, and in some cases, harm. So what we're going to do is have a discussion about some of the stereotypes that you guys might have come across. And I just want to stress, as uh, Zara said earlier, this is a completely safe space. So please don't feel like you have to be using uh, politically, politically correct language. We'd rather you guys share the kind of things you've heard or stereotypes you've come across rather than be worried about how this may be interpreted. This is a completely safe space. So feel free to um, use the language in a way that that you feel comfortable with. So the first, so just before we move on to the next slide, are there any in particular that stand out to you guys here today who are who are part of this session? Any any particular stereotypes that are more prominent as part of the LGBTQ plus community? Just feel free to shout out. It, it feels really unusual to be saying the stereotypes it feels uncomfortable 
Does that make sense? I um, could understand, yeah. Yeah, but I think from from my upbringing and where I've been brought up, some of the stereotypes are that every gay man is very camp and that every lesbian is butch, which obviously is not true, mm. but that's kind of a, a known stereotype. Is that what you're asking for? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. essentially, um, stereotypes essentially are just perceptions that people have of a group of people. Now, um, I've heard those stereotypes before as well. Obviously, we know that, that they're not true, but thank you for sharing that. That's that's really interesting. Is there anything else that people... And feel free, guys, to come off mute if you want, because this is far easier to to have a conversation. Yeah, uh, Dimar, Dimoria? So, Sophie, Sophie, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I'd just like to uh, reinforce that this is 100% not my opinion, just what I've heard or... And, and luckily, um, it is stuff I've heard quite a while ago and don't really hear it as much, but um, just that the LGBTQ plus community is quite promiscuous. Um, I, I, I've heard that a few times, obviously not true, but um, yeah, it's sort yeah. of sexualized, I think, sometimes. I, I don't yeah. know why, because you would and, never and... sexualize a, um, a, you know, a couple that were, weren't part of that community. So I don't know why you would sexualize the lgbtq plus community but um yeah i think that's come up for me before yeah well thank you for sharing that um zara if we could change the the slide we can then go on to the statements so some of the statements that we have is uh, people might generally come across and say i don't know anyone who is gay so what what kind of mm. thoughts what, sorry is someone going to say something no sorry that was me sorry no I'll, I'll that's go okay on. that's okay I'll... So I was just going to say, what when when we hear these kind of statements, this first one, I don't know anyone who is gay. If someone said that, what kind of thoughts come into your lot's heads? What kind of, where do you think this kind of stereotype might come from or this perception might come from? I think I'm guilty of, of saying that until um, a young person in our family um, came out. Um, and I've got to say now, I know absolutely loads of them. So um, quite happy with that. Quite ha happy that I do now know people who are gay and how lovely they are. So, yeah, you know, I'm happy about that. But I did I have said that. And and even if you have, I, what when those kind of when those stereotypes, because it's a very difficult thing to explain where you have these preconceived ideas from, but where do you think they originate from? Where do you think they come from? It's ignorance, isn't it? It's yeah. ignorance. It's 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 ignorance. It's, it's and, lack and, of awareness sometimes, isn't it? But I was brought up, my dad was Bengali and my mum English, so um, it's not something that would ever have been brought up or talked about within my family. And um, for me, when that young person came out, it was really a shock because um, it just wasn't a, a thing that was talked about. Or to me, it was, well, it just didn't come into our family. So it's not always ignorance. It's it's just the upbringing you've had and, and what is what is right and what is wrong in that family. So I think I've got to say that within my family, you know, being gay was a, a thing you don't do. Okay, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anyone else who'd like to um, add to this? So the next statement that we can look at is some people choose to be gay. What, when we hear that, again, a similar question, where do we think these stereotypes like this come about? What, what do we think people who say these sort of things are, who have these kind of preconceived ideas, where do we think they originate from? People like Donald Trump. Yeah, so people who have a position of power, if they share that kind of vitriol, it then passes on to the masses, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think from, from what the, the previous person was just saying, you know, these views can come from your community, your upbringing, your 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 family. Um, yeah, thoughts, misunderstandings you know, and presumptions. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, it's it's a, it's an ignorance and being open to people just being people, I suppose. 
you know, it's like my first thought with for the first one, I don't know anyone who's gay. But that's somebody's sexuality and why would you, you know, like you could work next to somebody and not know that they're gay because have you shared your sexuality with them? You know, like it's not a conversation that just comes up over coffee sometimes, is it? You know. Yeah, and often it's a very personal and intimate thing, isn't it? Um, thank you for sharing that. Zara could move on to the next one, just conscious of time. So majority of paedophiles are gay. Now, this is, again, another a very, um, I mean, just people who hold these kind of views, again, it's a very damaging and it often leads to a lot of harm uh, to people within the LGBTQ plus community. So are there any thoughts around this particular statement? And the next one as well, same sex couples have male and female roles. Um, this is more about sort of like identity and, and roles within same sex um, relationships often they'll they'll refer to people who ha who sort of like if they're in a lesbian couple if they're in a gay couple the person the the the, end, the individual who wears the pants within the couple or they refer to them as um, being the masculine or feminine uh, character because they assume that you know uh, they must replicate heterosexual relationships but as we know with any kind of relationship that's not the case um, and then we've got another statement you're not truly transgender unless you have gender reassignment surgery so Again, this is another stereotype that's with with any of these statements, this we have to take into consideration that people are often sharing things that they don't have a lot of knowledge or understanding on. So when it comes to transgender issues, um, reassignment surgery is a really hot debate. It's a really hot topic and often people it's a very personal thing that trans trans people will go through. So to hold an idea like that, it's, you know, it's very damaging. It can be very uh, problematic. The LGBT community is one big happy family. So again, you know, I know loads of gay people who don't get along with each other. I know loads of lesbian people who don't get along with each other. And that's quite common. That's That happens in the heterosexual cisgendered communities. So it's not specific to one uh, one area or one big uh, group of people. Um, and then your gender identity is the same thing as your assigned sex at birth. So again, this is that whole debate around um, you are born a particular gender and um, you're assigned that throughout your life. And if you were to change it, then that's going against tradition or convention. And gender identity is a social construct, you know, being um, uh, identifying as a boy or a girl. They are social constructs, how you choose to present yourself to to the wider world is ingrained within you from a young age and it changes depending on where you are in the world. So, um, sorry, uh, let me just read that comment in a second. So LGBTQ plus people are predominantly young, white, male, uh, young, white and non-religious. So again, this is not true. Um, a lot of people that I know are part of the LGBTQ plus community are not young, they're not white, and they're not, they are religious, so they 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 strongly hold um, faith beliefs. And I think often what happens is within the faith communities, there might be some disagreement on certain identities and what you can identify with. Um, and often people feel like as if people from the LGBTQ plus community are going against scripture. But really and truly, if you look into scripture, a lot of it is um, Mis uh, pre it's, it's, um, misinterpreted and uh, things can be taken in the wrong light. So when we look at all these as a whole, you guys can gain an understanding of the kinds of things that LGBTQ people face on a regular basis and the kind of misconceptions and stereotypes that they that they come across. I'm just going to read Finn's comment. Same sex couples having male female roles is like asking which chopstick is the nail, which is the fork. That's true, Finn. Thank you for sharing that. that can is I true. just say, though, on, on saying that, Finn, and coming, I've said that, I mean, within with the people that I know, the same sex couple I know, I have said which is the male and which is the female, but it's not said in, in, in any way, you know, it's how I see it. As a heterosexual, it's how I see it. It's not meant in any way to offend anybody. So I think then, sometimes I guess... we, we say, I say things that, I have, that, that are, are taken as an offensive thing it's not not from me it's not but that's how I see it so I said, yeah. I said it I guess I guess a bigger question is why do you feel like as if there needs to be a male or a female in 
that relation in a same sex relationship um, i don't feel as though that but it's how it's what you see you you see one more dominant than the other that's how i what i see you see the dominant one and the passive one if you like mm. and it just seems that way to me i and mean this nothing, is nothing this wrong is probably, with that from my point of view yeah. that's no no I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying there is anything wrong with it i, I think this is a conversation for a, a wider debate that yeah often see you are probably used to seeing heterosexual couples yeah. in a dominant and a passive role and yeah. you then apply those ideas onto same-sex uh, roles and same-sex relationships and often it doesn't translate the same yeah. So it's that preconceived idea. You might not have seen it as a negative, and I'm sure people who you were talking to within your communities and within your circles no. might not have necessarily taken it as a negative, but translating one ideology or identity from one community to the next is often damaging. And it's it's basically saying, well, if this person is like this or this community is like this, why aren't you guys like that? And that's where that friction comes from. Whereas actually, if you tend to be a bit more open minded and understand that actually, OK, this is a different way of looking at relationships and it's a different way of holding those um, those roles if they do exist. And I'm not saying they don't. Sometimes they do. You can clearly see in certain relationships, one might be more dominant, one might be more passive. It's it's recognizing that that doesn't apply everywhere and yeah. having that kind of preconceived sure. idea of this is a this this I'm used to this in heterosexual couples therefore it should be existent in same sex couples is what's uh, the issue around stereotypes really so um I'm aware it's that all a learning time, curve it's, it's all, all a learning, learning curve. curve and that's what these kind of sessions are for the, the safe yeah, yeah. space is to have these kind of discussions so thank you for sharing that um I'm going to now pass it on um so thank you for that uh Oh, sorry, I'm just going to read this comment. So Sophie says, I don't think being passive or dominant is linked to being masculine or feminine, but I think, but I have heard this thinking. Yeah, and it's a similar sort of thinking. You know, people often assume masculine with being dominant and passive with being feminine, but that's not the case, you know. Um, but thank you for sharing that, Sophie. Okay, so whose turn is it now? I think it's Finn's, it's is it? Back to me. It's back, back to you, Sophie. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think that was a really interesting discussion and thank you for, for leading on that. Obviously, there's quite a lot of stereotypes that uh, do exist out there. But I just want to talk a little bit about storytelling, because actually this is, uh, the, I think the storytelling is extremely powerful for, for a number of different views. Because actually when we hear stories, especially if they're good stories, we actually suspend our views of stereotypes, especially if they're emotive. So if the storyteller is really good at weaving a really compelling enough story, that really makes us react emotionally that actually releases dopamines in our brain which makes us get very hooked um, and that's when we think if you watch netflix and you look at your favorite series or your films and you get really hooked on it and you want to look at the next episode that's what's happening in our brain it makes our brain feel very focused and motivated to find out the ending and there's a sense of need and what is invoked as we're compelled to know the ending of that story so storytelling is actually a very important powerful way of getting key messages across to the people the other chemical that's released in your in your brain is actually oxytocin and that's um, the chemical in our brain that's responsible for social bonding and it's often referred to as the love hormone um, so generating oxytocin through storytelling actually can really build um, trust it bonds the storyteller and um, you as the audience um, listening in it just creates that much more better storytelling experience. So stories have a transformative power to allow us to see the world in completely in the different way that we actually do. And we've already talked a little bit about this earlier. But when we hear about that, what it does do is um, gives us an entry point to understand what it's like for somebody else. So it's a different experience and a different world. And we get to enter that. So stories that have a universal appeal, um, if we just think about when you were children, you know, you would have been told fables, stories. If you think about um, our religious textbooks, there are fables and, and morals and stories in there because they are the quickest way in which our brains are, uh, you know, spark imagination and creativity. And it's the, the fastest way that we can create, release those dopamines and oxytocin in our brain. We also appreciate and respect challenge and welcome differences of opinion when they're spoken, you know, truthfully and openly and within that con context. And obviously, in terms of conversations and real life stories, those interactions really connect people um, and are seen as really a positive experience uh, for, for people as well. 
And um, we generally tend to engage in stories um, around those internal perceptions and prejudices that we do feel uncomfortable with. And so stories are that kind of gateway that allows us to do that. I'm going to pass on to Finn, if that's all right, to share his story. Finn? Oops, there. Sorry, I lost my mic button. I was like, oh, where's it gone? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we thought it might uh, benefit the session if um, you actually heard from someone uh, sharing their story. Well, so you've got me, basically. Um, so I, I'm not originally from Bradford, but I came over the Pennines from Manchester to university and fell in love with the city and have not really left. Um, but to take you back to being younger, um, I am a child of the 80s. I went through the schooling system uh, under Margaret Thatcher's government, where we had the wonderful Section 28. So that prevented teachers from being able to discuss um, LGBT. Well, back then it was just mainly LGB um, uh, sexualities within schools because um, they didn't want to promote uh, an inappropriate lifestyle. Um, and so I didn't know that uh, gay people were a thing. I didn't know that people might be attracted to someone of the same sex or and I certainly had never even heard of trans people. Um, but as a as a, a, a younger person, I definitely knew that I was attracted to girls. Um, but I didn't know what to do with that and I didn't know who I could talk to about that. And then I came to university and I was like, oh, no, this is a thing. People can do this. This is great. Um, by which point I'd got a girlfriend and um, so I'd come out as a lesbian. Bear with me. This might not make much sense right now. Um, so I came out as a lesbian, like as a, a very late teenager um, and uh, was living my life um, quite well, I'd say happily, um, but still not feeling quite, I don't know. It was complicated, let's just put it that way. Um, but um, I got a family who dealt with my coming out in their own unique ways. Um, my parents like to um, bury their head in the sand until they got to a point where they had to publicly kind of acknowledge stuff. So my girlfriend was always um, introduced as my friend or my housemate um, or it, it, but never my partner or my girlfriend, which is how my brother's girlfriends were introduced. Um, and then I've got older brothers and younger brothers and um, they all reacted differently. Again, my little brother kind of followed mum and dad because he was still under their roof and um, and then older ones who were great. But I still wasn't being truly myself and my authentic self. So um, I much later on, I was but well, I discovered trans people uh, when I was at university. I was like, oh, no, this is the thing. And this is really amazing and it's great that people can actually be themselves and and great but it wasn't something that I'd thought to apply to myself even though I'd now got language around that um but by the time I got to 30 I was like actually I this is more who I think I am and this is the way that I want to uh now navigate through life um and at the time my wife was just like this is absolutely the right thing for you let's uh, pursue this so I got all my referrals to the gender clinic and I joined the very 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 long waiting lists um, and I eventually got to the top of the list and I jumped through all the hoops that the gender clinics were asking and saying I needed to do I changed my name way before then because I had a very overtly feminine name from my mum and dad because they were very thrilled to have had three sons and a daughter so so um uh, you know I was not allowed to wear a pair of trousers till I was about five um but the days that I started getting my brother's hand-me-downs I was like oh, this is amazing um yeah so um and I, I've since then I've gone on to uh, transition and I live my life as Finn and um as you can see I definitely don't look like that little girl that my mum and dad were so thrilled about. Um, and again, they all reacted very differently to my coming out the second time. So coming out and introducing myself as Finn. Um, and 
from my perspective, it was a lot harder to come out as Finn than it was to come out as the lesbian. Um, and I don't, I still can't understand why I struggled quite so much with that one. Like, I have great friends. I knew they were going to be okay, but I was still absolutely petrified of talking to them and going, hey, can we go by Finn? And can you use he and him pronouns instead of she and her, please? Um, and it was really scary. But throughout it all, like, I've been in Bradford and the misconception that it can be really, 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 really hard to be who you are in Bradford. Like, there's a lot of homophobia, there's a lot of transphobia. Um, is, I think, unfair at times. Um, absolutely. So it was, I've not experienced any transphobia since I have transitioned and since uh, the hormones have kicked in and I've gone through that boy puberty, which was less fun, let me tell you. Um, but um, yeah, so all those things that, you know, happen to teenage boys, I went through as a fully formed adult. So having that fully thinking brain of going, oh, this is why that's happening, but still having that uncontrollable, oh, this is happening, kind of incongruity at times was a challenge. Um, yeah, but it's, um, and I think part of that is down to how the media talks about the trans community. It's always very focused on young people being too young to know who they are versus trans women being a threat and a predator to women's spaces and trans men don't ever really get mentioned so it's, uh, or if we are talked about we're talked about as a confused lesbian and, and and if society treated women better then people wouldn't need to transition and that for me for my lived experience is couldn't be further from the truth before I transitioned, I would describe myself as trying really hard to be a girl, but never quite getting it right, but not quite knowing why I was getting it wrong either. Um, so so for me, since transitioning, um, life is so much easier and not just because I've now got the male privilege and I just float through now life a little easier. Um, but yeah, so it's it's um, it's been a it's been an interesting ride and I don't quite. Um, so for me. The main point is you don't always know who's in the room. Uh, you don't always know people's journeys and people's background, which is why um, challenging is really important because as someone who is confident and gobby and is very OK to go, hey, that's not an OK thing to say or that was like, what? Um, and, and challenging, like not everyone has that confidence. So being able to do that even if you're not part of the community and being an ally is really key and can make the world a difference to people who who are maybe less confident. I don't know where I was going with that, so I would, but I'm conscious of time as well. Thanks, Wayne. I think that was, um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, do, you, do you want to just cover very briefly about um, what people, um, my yeah. where they can go for further information yeah, yeah. so um we thought about um you know it, especially when the media at the moment talking about the trans community um is all quite slanted in quite a negative way at the moment um and how do you then go away and challenge what you've read or heard or what videos you've seen? So we've put some what what I consider trusted organisations down um, with their logo, so they're a bit easier to recognise. Um, Equity Partnership, Bradford based LGBT community um, uh, organisation charity. So that's a, a local starting point. We've got some of the big national ones so like Stonewall, uh, you might have heard of. They've just recently changed their logo. It was red. So if you're looking for the red logo, they've recently changed it. Um, you've got the LGBT Foundation, which is a long running Manchester uh, organisation. Gallup deals with LGBTQ plus domestic abuse predominantly. Um, and then uh, Yorkshire Mesmac is also based in Bradford and other parts of Yorkshire. Uh, they do a lot of work with the LGBT community and around uh, sexual health. Gendered Intelligence is a trans youth organisation. Mermaids works with trans the trans youth and families. The Proud Trust are over in Manchester, um, also doing youth work. And the Kite Trust, are they're down in Cambridge. So, you know, just because I've put some national ones and some random ones, if you're in Bristol, there's also great, you know, 
so depending on where you are, if you want local specific, there's typically an organization there. Just Google will help you. Um, but yeah, it becomes really challenging when you're reading those stories on places like the BBC website, um, which you should think is a trusted, impartial, but it's not always, um, in my opinion, at the moment. Um, yeah, so actually really going away and finding people with the lived experience can help dispel some of those myths that you might now be reading about, like all trans women in prisons and all of those, you know, whatever other horror stories the Daily Mail is putting out. And just one final point, uh, like the Times newspaper place um, publishes on average one anti-trans article a day. Um, to give you an idea of just how hard it can feel to be a trans person in the UK at the moment. Thanks, Finn. And um, just to go back, a, just a quick step as well, um, a couple of additional resources you can look at is uh, the People Library, which is based on the BradfordForEveryone.co.uk website. Um, Bradford for Everyone is the uh, was the integration cohesion programme that I led on about four years ago, but the website's still there. It's got a huge bank of resources, uh, what we're calling the human books. And so people can go on that site, read a bit more. The video um, here, um, which I'll share on the chat uh, in a second, is also available um, on the site as well. So you can get to hear other lived experiences, stories of um, individuals and people, because I think it's really important that happens. Um, also on the Bradford for Everyone uh, website, there is actually a, a page where you can actually download some of the toolkits here on the Make Sure It Adds Up campaign. So that's available. Just You just need to put in your email address and that gets sent out to you. Um, and just, just to end, because I think we've just we've reached our hour, um, just a quick quote. I think we all know who this guy is, but um, the quote is, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because of the picture with a quote next to it. Uh, clearly, Abraham Lincoln didn't say that, but it's um, just a, a, a generally just a quick quote is just to make sure that we're thinking critically and we are checking what we're reading and hearing before we're sharing. Thank you. Thank you.